Uh, good evening and welcome to the UN Global Compact Network Sri Lanka's webinar on women tech entrepreneurs reinventing the business world. My name is Maria Muldin and I am a private sector, uh, private sector associate at Network Sri Lanka. Uh, we encourage participants to pose any questions to the panelists via the chat box or Q&A function and the moderator will accommodate as many as time permits. The recent McKenzie Global Report on the Future of Work published in 2019 stated that 35% of new entrepreneurship in China in the field of technology have at least one woman on the founding team. In Sri Lanka, there is a growing potential for women technopreneurship and according to the Export Development Board of Sri Lanka, only 25% of women are entrepreneurs in the SME sector. Women require a holistic approach to, tech, tech, to technopreneurship. That encompasses a plethora of support ranging from psychosocial support to financing and empowerment on a much larger scale so that women can reinvent the business world. With that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's webinar. Mr. Ridgeway Arafin. Ridgeway is a multifaceted and multi -award -winning, award winning community development practitioner. He has recently been named a Forbes 30 under 30 and highlighted as a featured honoree for social impact. He also received the Diana Award and, car and currently works at the United Nations Global Compact as the target the equality advisor. He is also the co-founder and co-chair of the Global Royal Commonwealth Society Federator of multiple TEDx events. Vijay has a background in economics and received the Putra Icon Award for his all-round extraordinary performance. Vijay, over to you. Thank you, Mariam, for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I hope you and your close ones remain safe and it's a challenging time uh, posed by the global pandemic. My name is Rich Biarifin. I'm working at the United Nations Global Compact as the advisor of the Target Gender Equality Program. I'll be moderating today's session uh, titled Women Technopreneurs Reinventing the Business World, organized by UNGC Local Network Sri Lanka. We are very honored to have some incredible panelists today who bring in extensive experiences and insights on the topic of discussion. Just to give you a rough idea on um, how the session rundown looks like, uh, we will be here for an, um, about an hour, starting off uh, with a presentation by each of our panelists, and then we will uh, have some time in the end for moderated Q&A. Uh, as you hear from the panelists, please save your questions uh, for the segment in uh, respect of time. Uh, in respect of time, I, I would like to request our panelists to limit their presentation to a maximum 10 minutes. Now, a few uh, Zoom rules to uh, keep in mind. We hope uh, you'll be fully present during the session and provide your uh, undivided attention to the conversation. Please keep yourself on mute at all times. Feel free to share your comments and questions in the chat box, which we'll um, address towards the end of the session. You can also use the Zoom reactions if you want. Um, we, we also encourage you to keep your gun through the session for better engagement, as that's the closest we can uh, get on a virtual session. Um, so uh, without any further ado, let's get started. The Target Gender Equality is an accelerator uh, program focused on supporting UN Global Compact Company in setting and meeting ambitious corporate targets uh, to advance gender equality. Uh, most of the work is done at the ground level, led by our fantastic uh, local networks, such as the UNGC Sri Lanka. Uh, the current economic interventions and actions towards improving women and entrepreneurships um, has made a progress. Uh, however, to make considerable progress, there needs to be a holistic approach to access financing, uh, providing financial literacy, and uh, addressing technological skill constraints to create an uh, impact in the world of business. To shed light on uh, this timely topic, we have an incredible lineup of uh, panelists. 
please welcome Talal Rafi, Global Consultant on Corporate Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Gender Equality. We also have uh, Shamara Silva, Head of Channel and Category Development, Unilever Sri Lanka. Dilini uh, Ekanayake Samarukan, uh, Samarakan, Chief uh, People uh, Officer, Held Rekhan Kanek. And we also have Nilusha Fernando, Vice President, John Kills Group. To kick off the conversation, I would like to invite our first panelist, Mr. Talal Rafi, Global Consultant on Corporate Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Gender Equality. Talal Rafi is a member of the World Economic Forum Expert Network for his expertise on entrepreneurship and gender equality. He is also the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Plastic Innovation Network Action Group. As an entrepreneur, he co-founded one of uh, one of the Sri Lanka's first co-working spaces companies. He was on the selection committee of the Asian uh, Development Bank Digital Against um, COVID-19 Innovation Series and um, was on the team of experts at uh, Chatham House London on formulating recommendations for the G7 and G20 on gender equality post COVID-19. He consults as an industry expert under the World Bank Ahead uh, Project at uh, Moratua University. He is a World Bank uh, Climate Ambassador. Talal is on the global panel of MIT Technology Review. Uh, he has given talks globally, including at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and uh, Service um, Center and serves on the advisory board of a Silicon Valley startup working on bringing AI into the venture capital industry. His work has been published by the World Bank, uh, Asian Development Bank, World Economic Forum, and Forbes. Mr. Talal will speak on how women tech entrepreneurs can be empowered. The floor is yours, Mr. Mr. Talal. Uh, thanks a lot, Vijvi, for the warm introduction, and thank you, everyone. Uh, a very essential topic, I would say. So let me start off. Uh, why I say it's essential? Because the gap is quite big, especially when it comes to the tech sector. So if you look at Sri Lanka, I want to start off like uh, only 10% of Sri Lankan employers are female. So we find a 90% uh, dominance by males. And it gets worse, like most of the uh, women entrepreneurs are at the micro level. As it goes bigger, the percentage decreases. And uh, when we dive a little bit deeper into the Sri Lankan tech ecosystem, uh, the startup ecosystem, we find that 96% are male founders, only 4% are female. So, so uh, coming to the topic, uh, why is uh, women entrepreneurship in tech essential? So I would say uh, for three reasons. One is, um, I mean, there are more reasons, but I'll just uh, give three. Uh, one is the tech sector. I would say uh, during, even during the height of the pandemic, we saw that uh, it was one sector that grew exponentially wealth wise, it generated a lot of wealth. And we already know that there's a huge uh, gender wealth gap. And uh, according to the World Economic Forum, it'll take over a hundred years to bridge the gender gap. So by women uh, not being um, in the tech sector as entrepreneurs, they're getting left behind and the, uh, the gender wealth gap could widen. So that's one reason. The second reason is uh, if women fail to get into the tech sector as entrepreneurs, uh, there will be a lack of uh, female perspective. Like, for example, we see uh, the tech companies have a massive influence in our lives, like uh, Facebook uh, uh, determines how we communicate or Uber, how we order our food or how we travel and Tesla with electric cars. So and uh, also the example is like uh, once uh, for automated cars, uh, when uh, they couldn't understand the female voice. So that was uh, later it was founded because all the engineers were male. So. So we need to have a female perspective to create a blueprint for the 21st century. Otherwise, like, the tw uh, like I always say, 18th, 19th, 20th uh, centuries, like the 21st also uh, is in the danger of uh, being male dominated. And uh, lastly, so the third reason is that uh, why uh, women should be in the tech is because uh, women are in many cases better startup founders than males. Uh, so this is through my experience with the World Bank Ahead Project and with the Asian Development Bank as well. What I find is that uh, female uh, entrepreneurs in the tech sector or any sector, they are more dedicated, uh, more organized and more determined and passionate. Uh, so so uh, then moving on to like, if this is the case, uh, what is the problem then? Why is there a huge uh, digital gender gap? So. We, then we look into the challenges faced by women, uh, especially in the tech sector. 
So the first thing is, uh, without a doubt, it's access to capital. So we find uh, one thing is uh, getting loans. So that's one area that we are working on. So I'm engaged with the ADB on their women's finance exchange. So where it's trying to get the uh, uh, women to uh, be able to better get loans from banks. Uh, the other one is uh, getting access to investments. So this is uh, another area that uh, I'm on the advisory board of a Silicon Valley startup. What we want to do is uh, democratize uh, with the venture capital industry. What we find is even in the US, about 80% uh, of uh, VC funding goes to male-only startups. Only 2% go to female-only. So we need to change this uh, perspective. So uh, what, we want, what we are trying to do is uh, through machine learning and AI, uh, to get rid of the gender bias, not just the gender bias, but cultural bias, age bias. So that's uh, one thing. And uh, the second thing would be the challenges. Uh, the main thing is the work family balance. So even with the ADB, we find that uh, women tend to work two and a half to four times more than men. So, and this is like unpaid work. Uh, and uh, even where women are the primary earners, 43% of the time, they still tend to do most or all of the work. And uh, this is very something that's uh, overlooked a lot, I would say. But uh, why this is very important is because this time could be used for reskilling, uh, do extra work, um, do a side hustle, network. And uh, the other challenge is networking. So even with my uh, work with USAID, where we were trying to create a mentoring platform, what we found was the biggest challenge was for young women to network. Uh, so most of the, so it's very critical as an entrepreneur myself, we need to be connected with people at the highest level of the corporate world or the state level. Uh, and uh, what they find is uh, they're a bit awkward because, um, or find it a bit uncomfortable to approach uh, people mostly above the age of 50 uh, males. Uh, so, so that was one complaint we got. Uh, so so that, that was a challenge we were trying to uh, sort out especially when doing the mentoring platform. And uh, the last thing is the gender bias. As uh, one thing like uh, coming from a, uh, working from a, uh, on a st startup in the VC industry, I would say that there's a sort of a bias. What we find is that uh, when uh, male startups uh, pitch, usually the question from VCs is, uh, so what is that to gain? And when it's from a female founder, the question is usually, so what can we lose? So it's so always they look, it, uh, look at it as a risky venture. And uh, coming to the question, so what can be done to empower women? Uh, the first thing is, uh, this was something that I wrote on for a World Bank research piece as well. So it's uh, that we need uh, more women in the tech sector. Why we see this is because uh, after speaking to a lot of uh, young women technopreneurs, we find that many of them used to work in the tech sector before coming and starting off uh, uh, businesses somewhat related to where they work from. Like uh, this, is, this is a norm, like even if you find the founder of Zoom, he worked in the tech sector before doing something similar. So we find that this would uh, make uh, women more confident to come into the tech sector because one thing shared by uh, Facebook senior executive Sheryl Sandberg says that women are less confident when it comes to the tech sector. But uh, there's nothing to feel uh, less confident about. I could assure that that. Uh, the many startups I work with, women outperform men. And this is backed by a study by the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, and uh, the second thing that we could do is uh, scaling up. So this was one of the primary recommendations that I gave at uh, Chatham House, where we were formulating recommendations for the G7 uh, on gender equality post-COVID. So one thing is, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, most of the uh, women-led businesses at the smaller level. And then as you go bigger, the percentage comes down. Even in Sri Lanka, the largest uh, corporations, only 5% uh, are owned or led by women. So scaling is important. And how we can do that is uh, having more accelerators. Like the current one, I'm working with at uh, Morotua University. So accelerators not just provide uh, space, but also the resources, the mentoring uh, services, such as uh, legal services, accounting services, and at the same time, access to investment. And uh, lastly, this is uh, one point that I keep stressing, not just related to the tech sector, but also wider to empowering women in, the, uh, in entrepreneurship is uh, we need to have more women on the corporate boards. So this is something that I'm also currently writing a piece for the World Bank. And uh, what we find is that uh, one of the things is that uh, 
the more women we have on a corporate board, the more likely they are to support. Because as an entrepreneur, I know that we need the support of large corporations, whether they want to invest with us or whether they want to partner or be our customers. So the more women we have on the boards, uh, the better. And in Sri Lanka, this figure is very low. I mean, only 8.5% of uh, board seats in listed companies at the Colombo Stock Exchange are female. And when it comes to private owned companies, like larger companies, it's the percentage is much lower. And also having a few, uh, most of the companies have one or two, which uh, makes it even worse. Like a study shows that by Harvard Business Review shows that you need at least three women on the board for them to make a contribution meaningful. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, it's also so that uh, the more we have on boards, the more they can be mentors and role models. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Talal, for you. sharing your insights. Um, you, you have definitely made some great points on the significance of women's participation in uh, tech entrepreneurship. I also believe that uh, in a world of rapid development in information technology, it is vital to uh, tap into women's active participation in tech entrepreneurship. Otherwise, uh, it will be a huge loss for the global economy as well. However, uh, when we talk about um, women entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship in general, we usually focus on the city center, whereas um, rural communities can also become creative entrepreneurial centers that directly assist in rural economic development. As women carry the burden of poverty, it is important that uh, women are empowered through the means of entrepreneurship to promote and um, advance economic development in such rural areas. To sp speak more on rural entrepreneurship for women, next up, uh, we have Ms. Shamara Silva, Head of uh, Channel and Category Development, Unilever Sri Lanka. Shamara Silva, who is a part of customer development leadership team at Unilever Sri Lanka carries with her nearly 15 years of reach and diverse experience at uh, Unilever spanning both uh, marketing and sales uh, fun functions across brand building, brand development and customer development in Sri Lanka and international markets. Chamara has a, a I'm sorry, I'm having a difficult, um, all right. Uh, Shamara has a, a proven history for uh, driving turn, turn rounds, redefining brands and business for future, accelerating opportunities, um, and uh, creating purpose-led in brands and selling avenues. Shamara is a strong advocate for diversity and inclusion uh, through breaking stereotypes. She is an involved mother to an energetic toddler, plays an active role in her charge, and uh, is an amateur foodie as well. Ms. Shamara, please have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think one of the starting points of building technopreneurs and women into uh, the technology field is first and foremost, ensuring that women participate in entrepreneurship. And that is for developing countries, that is a fundamental step. And today I've been asked by the UNGC to share with you a uh, best practice and a proven model that we at Unilever have, uh, which spans almost two decades, uh, which has enabled to impact livelihoods and ensure that there is the right type of entrepreneurship model um, that ensures the livelihood development of rural women. And today this project is largely a physical uh, led selling model, but we are in the process of ensuring this development in through technology. And I will share a little bit of those um, uh, project uh, aspects, which are right now in implementation as well as in development as well. Um, if we could move slides, I don't seem to have control. Yeah. So, Project Sabagia, which started off almost two decades ago as a CSR project of Unilever, is today a business avenue, a route to market, and a channel for us. And I think as businesses, the critical point is to see the opportunity for women and, and female entrepreneurship as a business opportunity and a business uh, venture. So these female entrepreneurs, they actually serve their communities through serving uh, the Unilever product portfolio, 
We have been uh, one of the first pioneer countries globally that started this concept of enabling livelihoods and female entrepreneurs and calling out women uh, to specifically uh, involve them in the business. Um, and through this uh, model, which we have developed, it has now been rolled out across the world in DNE markets and is proven to drive success, both for a business as well as for those people and the communities that it impacts. And that is uh, one of the core reasons for uh, having a sustained self-funded model and the role that businesses and private sector can play in enabling and creating the pathway for women to come into entrepreneurship. The beautiful faces that you see on the screen are women who are, some who are sole breadwinners for their families, um, as well as women who use uh, this channel uh, that Unilever offers and the framework that Unilever offers to provide an extra income to their families. Uh, specifically, you know, to expand the, um, the areas of education for their children. We impact about 3,100 women, um, a, a little more than that, uh, across the country uh, and island-wide. Uh, about 2,500 villages are impacted. And uh, one of the reasons that this has been such a sustained uh, long-standing partnership is because of the fact that it is, um, it, it's led and it's partnered through a public-private partnership. Now, what I'll do is, um, if you can move to the next slide. Um, what I first want to share is the reason why Sabagia was designed and is even today designed to serve. And it is to impact and reduce the poverty and in income inequality that is there, particularly among women, uh, because they drop out of the labor force and they uh, don't often re-enter it and there is uh, less economic independence that women have. And, and through creating that, we are able to promote better gender equality. And, and as businesses, as private sector, we need to recognize our role that we can play in creating those frameworks that will enable women to be successful with the microfinancing they may take, or with the business um, opportunities that they have to create that income for themselves. Now, one of the pr uh, primary uh, reasons or, or success reasons for this project, uh, which today is now a business channel for us, is that there is a close link between the socioeconomic purpose that it is meant to serve, as well as the, uh, the business framework and the financial rationale from a, a business perspective. Now, uh, this was built through first understanding some of the key issues that women face in first entering into entrepreneurship. Women drop out of the labor force very often and sometimes hardly participate. Uh, and rural women particularly have very little access to financial resources and that forms a barrier for them to enter. Their skill levels uh, or even this career gap or uh, service gaps create this uh, barrier for entry. And let's face the facts. The reality is in the South Asian environment, females have a multifaceted um, expectation from for a social expectation. And despite the economic participation, there is still, uh, they will still bear the sole responsibility of child caring as well as elderly caring and um, household chores. So the reality is this, and um, as, as businesses understand this, but still realize the value that females can bring into their businesses, uh, that creates the opportunity for us to create frameworks. And that's what Project Sabagia has actually done. Because we have today a model which has a very low startup cost, almost as low as two to 3,000 rupees. Um, and we create a network through which we can access, we help them create the access to microfinancing. And we do it in a step-by-step -step manner so that they are not actually put into a situation where they're unable to service the loan which they have taken. The other uh, aspect is that we have recognized for our business 
the importance of the skill that she has, the skill of a home, homemaker. And that skill is harnessed in such a way that um, it, it, it powers the, the business framework that is there. And so there's that skill gap that she actually is faced with is now being uh, reduced. But we provide for those skill gaps uh, through the training that we can offer because that's something we rec recognize is always something you can give to an individual. Now, using her uh, existing skill set, we are therefore able to create this business framework. And most important is creating that flexibility to control her work, her work hours, and her workload. Uh, and through that, we have been able to create a business case which has been sustained. And through um, delivering that business results, uh, it has enabled the success and the sustenance of this project. Next slide. Now, I'll just share with you a little bit um, of the operating model, uh, which can be used when we create frameworks uh, going into uh, even the technopreneurship uh, uh, aspects. So the first is that we do need to understand the recruitment phases, the um, initiation and incubation. So when we recruit, we have to have the right sources of recruiting uh, to the business. Uh, also very important is how they're initiated or how they're incubated in this process. So we have a proven model, uh, an existing system which ensures her success and which uh, develops her through giving her the skills and uh, filling any skill gaps that she has. Uh, these processes which we have over time developed, over time uh, mastered, is really what enables her to be successful uh, in servicing her loans, in, in um, ensuring her business success. Next slide. Now, when they have been recruited, we also then, um, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, after recruitment, it's important to ensure they continue and they are developing in uh, previous slide. Yeah, developing. Um, so we, we partner her in identifying her eligibility for the type of loan that uh, she is uh, able to service. We also incentivize um, her retention in the process. Uh, we incentivize her financially for developing her business, as well as work towards improving her social status in the, the community and the customer base that she services. Next slide. And this is the, um, the important thing to share today for, in the context um, as we are looking at a uh, a model today which is physically done but we are moving it into the digital space and how we're doing it is really ensuring that women are uh, the skills that they have the communication and technology skills that is available today is able to be harnessed into uh, the, this environment and this uh, business model that we have so using simple formats like mobile based business um, apps, we are able to today, we have a uh, operating model called Using, which uh, is a digitization of the order and receive platform. So she is able to now uh, have more flexibility in how she orders and how she delivers. Um, and there's also a opportunity for her to anytime um, create those orders and therefore build uh, new avenues of business. Now, the next aspect is one which we are piloting today, which will really unlock more women who are sometimes even confined uh, entirely to their homes and are unable to work um, from, uh, you know, even uh, move out from a home for, for a, even a short period of time. And that is Project Envoy. Again, a mobile-based app, which enables her to work from home. Now, creating these kind of technological uh, solutions really will enable more and more women, uh, more and more females to participate uh, and become uh, entrepreneurs. And that is the role that we as businesses uh, can play to create frameworks, which will enable her, not just uh, from an aspect of being a technopreneur, 
but also creating uh, platforms which will enable her to be an entrepreneur uh, using technology. Final slide. Um, I'd like to leave you with some stories to impact you uh, because looking at these lives and the impact that these lives have uh, have had uh, really does uh, encourage us as Unilever to continue on this journey to to see how we can find more avenues to drive entrepreneurship uh, among women uh, this the the first lady here Shriyanti uh, from Ghana Mulna she had to step up to be the main breadwinner for her family when her husband was disabled uh, and for eight years now, she's been with Saubhagya and uh, she has provided for her family and her children's education through this project. Uh, on the right hand side top, you see uh, a young girl who uses Saubhagya and it's, it supplements her income today. Uh, and she is funding her education, her higher education through using um, the using platform, the technology platform that, it, that we have. Uh, and so she has the flexibility of both time and working um, from home. Um, we also enable um, the economic inclusion of even senior women because there's no age gap to, uh, or age limit to the participation. And that's the lady you see on the bottom uh, left-hand corner. Uh, she is Aryavati from, um, uh, Kalelia, and she has uh, she's one of our long-standing uh, participants in this um, uh, channel, and uh, she she earns almost uh, forty thousand rupees uh, per month, and that uh, forms her um, uh, uh, income to her family. And finally, um, we have. Uh, Dharmavati uh, Manike, who is from uh, Babaragasrava in Galeval, and that's uh, a very, a very a remote rural community. But because of her a sustained financial progression over the years, she has uh, um, moved up and today is now uh, an owner of a um, uh, almost a self service outlet, uh, which she has progressed uh, in her journey and developed. So these are the stories that energize us, uh, that uh, drive us as Unilever to keep exploring the opportunities that we as a business can make uh, to impact livelihoods and change lives um, through the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shamara, for highlighting the criticality of uh, rural entrepreneurship for women. And we definitely need to be more mindful when we are designing, you know, like programs fostering entrepreneurship that is scalable across the country, including rural areas. Um, next, I would like to invite our panelist, uh, Ms. Thilini Ekanayake Samarakun, uh, Chief People Officer, Health Raccoon, um, Health Raccoon Connect, for sharing her uh, perspective on women-led tech entrepreneurs um, based on her past experience. A little bit about Ms. Thilini. As the, chief, um, as the chief people officer, uh, Tilini helps shape the overall people strategy for um, Health Recon Connect with over 15 years of ex uh, experience in both HR specialist and generalist disciplines. Tilini has a deep domain knowledge of uh, human capital management within the business uh, process management industry. Uh, while she's uh, passionate about learning and development and technology enabled HR services, she uh, drives the overall strategy for human capital management for HRC in her current role. Her industry experience includes 15 plus years in the BPO and KPO space, revenue cycle management, um, finance and accounting as well. During her career, Filini has worked with multicultural teams and has supported global op operations whilst um, adhering to international quality and process improvement standards and industry best practices. Filini holds an MBA from the University of Colombo and a BA in business administration from the University of London. A mother of one and an entrepreneur, um, Filini also plays an advisory role for the BPO Connect, um, BPO Connect group of companies. Over to you, Ms. Filini. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be part of the discussion. Hope all of you can hear me clearly. Um, 
just a little intro about the company I represent uh, because it's perhaps a name that you haven't heard before. Um, Health Recon Connect is uh, HRC for short. Uh, it's an entrepreneurial venture. It's my first foray into entrepreneurship. And uh, the last five years of our company, the journey has been uh, a great adventure. We offer revenue cycle solutions to the healthcare market of the US. Uh, and currently we have 1,500 people across four countries. Uh, technology is a big part of how we drive our business. Uh, we use AI, robotics uh, to create solutions for existing clients. And we are also on a journey to introduce uh, tech solutions to the healthcare market. I must tell you though, that I'm not from a tech background. I'm an executive in a business that is tech focused. Having said that, um, I'll get onto my topic, uh, which is about tech, uh, women that tech on entrepreneurship. Uh, I'll be focusing more on the urban population from a perspective of getting into tech. Uh, Mariam, please help me with the slides. Uh, we'll move on to the first one. Um, so I don't have um, any extensive stats on women in tech, but the general consensus and the data that's re readily available points to a number of facts, which I've um, listed down here. So female representation at sea level of tech companies seem to be very low. Uh, percentage of female undergraduates and graduates in computer science or software engineering is much less in comparison to male counterparts. Female-led startups receive less funding in comparison. Uh, Talal confirmed that, unfortunately. Uh, number of sole tech entrepreneurs is also quite low. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of stats because that will take up my entire time. But the more important message, I think, in my opinion, is not so much that there's not enough diversity in the world of tech, but that the world of tech is expanding so much, so fast, that there are more opportunities than there ever was. So that will be the focus of my session, opportunities. Um, Miriam, we'll go to the next slide, please. Thanks. So what can we see when we um, you know, look around the world that, that we, you know, when we start paying attention to the trends that, that, uh, that's in the world of work? Number one, I think, is that all industries have enormous potential for including technology into how their business model works. Shamara just explained to us how they have succeeded in one model of using technology and enhanced that uh, service channel. Uh, you don't have to dig too deep to find uh, that, that sort of similar story in the world of work. From healthcare to banking, manufacturing, retail, fashion, food, education, you name it, technology is essential. Um, the world is also more connected, the second point. It also means that there's a bigger platform for creative individuals to see spot opportunities within different markets and to be in the right place and the right time and target their solutions to a global audience. Um, third part, which, which happened after the pandemic, uh, working from home, remote work, whichever you want to call it, uh, it's changed the way work is organized and how people connect. It's become necessary to leverage more technology uh, and information, communication to create flows, uh, workflows, build culture, uh, drive processes, which were done differently before the pandemic. Uh, another interesting part is that there's a global drive for diversity. It's been one of the most hot uh, topics for in, in the recent past. Um, it's an opportunity because there's acceptance that there's an increasing diversity in the consumer market. Therefore, uh, the companies making the products or services across the uh, across the world, they have to or are increasing the diversity of the workforce so that they are able to better cater to the market. So that's that's a great opportunity. Another wonderful opportunity is that Gen Zs are entering the world of work. So this in most countries, Gen Zs start coding before fifteen years of age. It's a part of their curriculum. Um, and in general, they are far more attuned to tech than previous generations because they grow up surrounded by it. They're not afraid of tech. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity or a boost to the workforce, I think, especially for a country like Sri Lanka. Um, of course, granted that this focus attention on how we expose our children to STEM-related uh, study streams, 
but it's still nonetheless an opportunity. Um, last but not least, access to resources globally. There's an increased access, even for people like me, uh, who didn't grow up with this much tech exposure, there are numerous resources online to understand uh, what those technologies about and even get certified at different levels in our careers. Um, so the, the thought to leave with you here on this slide is that these opportunities are available to a global workforce. And I'm looking at work or products or services focused towards global outcomes. Right. So moving on, uh, Maria, please. For all professionals, there's a choice uh, of working for oneself or um, working for others. Both has benefits and risks. Working for someone else, for an organization, um, it gives you lots of learning. Uh, it gives you exposures to work uh, with um, different technologies, different uh, or diverse talent, uh, and make mistakes, not on your own count, uh, and learn from them, and also understanding markets. Right. Entrepreneurship has a different element of risk because the buck stops with you, essentially. Also because the success is proportionate to the effort you put in, especially to get things off the ground. But I truly believe if one has a great business concept and the belief in one's ability to deliver value, the rest is doable. It takes a lot of tenacity, a lot of grit. Moving on to the next slide, please. One of the most commonly cited barriers in relation to why there are lesser number of females, uh, female execs in technology, at least from what I read, um, is uh, that of lack of role models. I think there are very strong role models, even though they are, there might be few, but they're very strong indeed. Um, and I think if we cast the net a little bit wider, uh, I think that there's a lot of inspiration that can be found. What I mean is, if you look at female leaders overall versus female leaders in tech, there's plenty of great examples. Some of the most powerful global roles are played by female leaders, uh, head of IMF or um, Chancellor of Germany, um, just two examples. Uh, but there's plenty more examples from Sri Lanka as well. I mean, there are two people uh, on this panel itself that are leaders who are using tech to um, get their business uh, to the next level. Um, in the tech world per se, I think, I mean, uh, Talal mentioned Sheryl Sandberg, an, an instrumental uh, catalyst to how big Facebook has become, uh, one of the greatest ideas, but she's the one who actually came up with or helped establish it uh, as a platform for small businesses. And then it you know, grew into this giant. Um, Amy Hood, um, Executive Vice President of CFO at um, Microsoft, Belinda Johnson at uh, Airbnb, uh, Jeannie Rometty, one of the most powerful women, often cited, um, CEO of IBM. These are global examples, but there's plenty of local as well. Um, I think another perspective is that we uh, predominantly focus on people at top spots, but not so many stats exist on people on the way to the top who are working in their current capacities, contributing perhaps at lower levels, but very successfully using technology in, in, in many ways. Uh, there are also female-led startups who are smaller players in the grand scheme of things, but no less inspirational. So I've, I've put down a few in the next slide, um, Maria. So this Cloque from Brazil, a women-led tech entrepreneurship, a startup, tech startup, it provides nano credit and financial literacy resources via an app to the poor and the unbacked. Uh, Digitale from Spain, it's a software startup for vet clinics and it's AI enhanced, fully customizable and to, to use. Uh, Fove Inc, available in US and Japan, created the first consumer friendly priced VR headset with complete eye tracking technology. So just this number of um, examples, there's some more or plenty more if you know where to look for inspiration. So if I go into the next slide to talk about what can one do if you're at the beginning of your career, learn about career paths and different jobs you can do. Being in tech does not mean you need to know how to code or that you'll be fixing computers uh, for hours and hours uh, and then. 
There are so many job roles available. I think the best thing to do is to get to know them, do your research and plan your studies around them. If you are mid-career, pay attention to markets, keep watching the trends, look at different elements from different industries and how they interconnect. Um, and you know, study how technology is used by these different organizations. Some of the most powerful female leaders in tech companies have come from different study streams. They're not techies per se, but they have an acute understanding of what technology can bring to the industry they're in, the company they're in, and how, how they can actually use it to, to um, change the course of the company's um, fortunes. If you've already taken the first step and decided to become an entrepreneur, I think you should know your own story very well and what you stand for and what your value proposition is. Uh, be ready to fail and take the learning. I think that's one of the biggest things. Uh, give yourself time because all entrepreneurs learn through experience. There's a lot, um, there's also the lesson of uh, other people. You can read, you can observe lessons of what, what uh, succeeded or what worked for them, what didn't work for them. I think at all of these levels, commit to lifelong learning. That's, that's the message I will leave. Um, so in conclusion, the opportunities uh, that technology has created in the world, they are enormous. From a capability perspective, I think Talal mentioned this at, at his uh, session. I believe that this, that one gender has no advantage over the other when it comes to technology. In some um, industries, there may be, uh, you know, physical or any other uh, differentiation, but in technology, it, I can't see any difference in terms of capability. Um, I also believe that most, if not all female, uh, successful fem female leaders that I have referred to uh, in my session today, uh, they, don't, they don't seem to define themselves against their male counterparts or lack of privilege uh, along their journey, uh, but more defined themselves against the strength of their story or the value. Uh, and the courage or the, the strength of their convictions. So that's what I will leave you with. Thank you very much, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Lenny, for uh, sharing some excellent points, highlighting different aspects on how it is beneficial to empower women tech like entrepreneurs. Uh, today's discussion would remain incomplete if we don't talk about the critical role of the private sector in empowering women entrepreneurs to offer her insights um, I would like to invite our last, but definitely not the least, um, uh, panelist, Ms. Nilusha Fernando, Vice President, John Kills Group. Nilusha is, a, is the head of marketing at JK Marketing Services, um, operating as Kills Supermarkets and joined the John Kills Group in 2009 as a management trainee. She's a past finalist of the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, holds a BBA in finance degree from the University of Colombo and an MBA uh, from the Cardiff Metropolitan University. She was instrumental in the rebranding exercise of the business and driving a sustainability agenda for the retail chain. Ms. Nilusha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rajwad. Mariam, can I ask uh, you to move to the next slide? Let me jump right in. Uh, what I want to do is walk through some examples of why and how including diversity in the private sector agenda is important now more than ever. Let's first take a look at the approach to diversity, equality and inclusion that the John Kills Group has embarked upon. In September 2020, the group launched its DENI brand, One JKH, spearheaded by a separate team with the commitment of the leadership. What you see here in board is actually what we stand for, the values that the One JKH brand stands for. Regardless of or irrespective of any form of difference, we are one, and that's what One JKH stands for. Along with this, the group also announced a five-year goal to increase female participation in the workforce up to 40%. Now, in trying to do this, there are many initiatives that the business has undertaken. Some are currently being worked on to attract and retain female talent at all levels. Some of these initiatives are promoting agile working environments, 
rolling out processes for employer-supported childcare and conducting awareness on topics such as unconscious bias. There are two specific projects around uh, empowering females in the community and supply chains that I want to expand on uh, in the next couple of slides. But before that, if we move to the next slide, let's take a look at how, Mariam, if you can, thank you. Let's take a look at how the group goal to achieve 40% participation of females in the workforce was announced on International Women's Day 2021 and widely communicated across various platforms, uh, showcasing females in different range of vocations within the group, including our supply chains. If we move to the next slide, Mariam. Thank you. Uh, these are the two projects that I was actually speaking about. Uh, from a group pers perspective, Praja Shakti was an initiative undertaken by the John Kears Foundation uh, and the two stories that I want to share uh, around that initiative. Ranliya Women's Society of Batevala uh, was one uh, society that the Praja Shakti initiative focused on. They were making envelopes by hand although they did have access to a paper cutting machine. That was because they did not know how to use that machine. So what John Kears Foundation did was in collaboration with the Kadwela Divisional Secretariat and the Batevela Grama Niladari, they trained these ladies on how to use this machine effectively so that they can produce products such as bags, basak lanterns and lunch boxes, and therefore make a living during these difficult times. Similarly, in Hikadua, a group of female batik artisans got a lifeline during the pandemic with the support once again of John Kears Foundation, Hikatrans by Cinnamon, the Hikadua Divisional Secretariat, and the Academy of Design, where our program was launched to skill and train these ladies in the art of batik. The second project is actually done by Elephant House, this is a program called Diriya Upahara, recognizing well-performing female distributors in their distributor network. Let's move to the next slide. I want to take a look at the retail industry specifically. It is a very dynamic industry. Some would say it's almost a 24 seven kind of working environment. At the moment, female representation at Kiel supermarkets stands at a 49% across various levels. Back in the day, majority of this female representation uh, was built on the females who were in the cashiering positions. But that, those days are past now. We now have females in customer service assistant, chefs, outlet managers, and even a regional manager position. So we've been able to increase our female participation across many levels. Moving on to our supply chains, we work with approximately 4,000 plus farmers, of which about three to 5% are female farmers providing vegetables and fruits to our collection centers across the country. In a recent partnership that the Kiel Supermarkets embarked upon to build future ready agripreneurs, we, were, we are working with 400 farming units of which 10% are female. And here we are providing support and skills such as financial literacy, crop protection, post harvest handling, and effective irrigation. And here too, that 10% of females are going to benefit through these skills. When looking at our dry goods suppliers, particularly the small and medium suppliers, once again, just about 3% are women led businesses spread across both food and non-food categories. If we move to the next slide, um, let's take a look at some of the initiatives that were undertaken in retail to increase females in the workforce as well as our supply chains. Uh, one of the most important things we realized earlier on was the importance of changing our ways of working if we wanted to adapt. We found that our meat counters 
the heights was a barrier for a female employee to interact effectively with customers. So we worked towards reducing the height of these counters, making it a comfortable workplace for them to work in and interact better with the customers. We also understood that transporting goods from the back store to the front of the store to stock shelves was a labor intensive process. Therefore, we went and invested in roller cages, making it really easy to wheel in and out to the floor some of the stocks from the back store and effectively and conveniently stack the shelves. We've also worked hard on increasing the female participation in non-traditional roles like IT, engineering, and architects. These roles were majority dominated by males in the past, but we've worked on an effective program to increase the female participation here too. I will run through some initiatives that KILS has executed to support females in our communities and our supply chains. If we can move to the next slide, please. So we launched a concept called Podi Business Tana to support small scale vendors during the pandemic. We realized that small scale vendors have lost their livelihood. So we allowed a car parking slot free of charge for vendors in our locality or neighborhood who can now come and sell their products. And there were lots of females who took up that opportunity. Furthermore, we, want, we also started an initiative called Vyavasaya Kasavya, where we were supporting micro entrepreneurs and manufacturers to develop skills such as supply chain, financial literacy, marketing, uh, more recently digital marketing, and even things like financial reporting. We also embarked on a program with John Kills Foundation and Gateway to educate and conduct an English language scholarship program for our small scale suppliers. And here too, we had a lot of females participating enthusiastically in this program uh, where they were skilled with the language. Finally, let's move to the next slide, please. Let's take a look at the lessons learned through our experience in the private sector and some steps that we can take to encourage females in our workforce and drive female participation in our supply chains. Fostering diversity and inclusion requires in a business that everybody embraces this. And it's imperative that you have the support of leadership. Introducing affirmative actions such as work from home, flexible working hours or part-time is important for females to thrive in their careers. Seeking private and public sector partnerships is crucial to provide the right training and I think Shamara also showed some slides around this. And one good example was how John Kears Foundation worked on the Praja Shakti initiative. Supporting research and data collection uh, would be helpful to identify any latent issues which can be rectified. Taking one step further, it's also important that private sector drive inclusive policies in their supply chains and towards their suppliers to increase female participation in supply chains. Even as a retailer, females constitute our core customer group. So it makes absolute business sense to have products or sell products made by women for women. It is important to note that when women have access to the right opportunities, it is proven that not only does it increase financial independence, it also reduces poverty and enhances social development. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nilusha, for your insightful contribution. The private sector definitely has multi-faceted avenues to empower um, women. Well, uh, we have heard some great points from our panelists today. We will now move to the question answer session. Uh, I already have a couple of questions in the uh, in in hand, so I, I guess I can start off uh, with those. Meanwhile, our attendees can uh, write your question in the chat, and I'll get to those right after. Uh, if your question is directed to a specific panelist, please do mention that in the chat as well. 
So uh, my first question is for uh, Mr. Talal. Um, Women-led startups generally receive a very insignificant percentage of uh, VC funding, right? So in your opinion, what are the challenges um, faced by women tech entrepreneurs when it comes to uh, getting venture capital funding? You're, you're muted. Yeah, uh, so when it comes to VC funding, I see that uh, the biggest challenge would be the bias. As I mentioned before, uh, when it's a male founder pitching, the question is more about what is to gain. And when it's a female, it's like, what is to lose? Even though all the stats say that uh, female uh, led uh, startups can perform better in most of the areas. Uh, so, so that's the uh, biggest challenge. And also there was a study uh, by MIT, Harvard and uh, Wharton School done where the person pitching was not shown. Only the voice was uh, shown and uh, uh, played out. And uh, a male voice and a female voice. And the exact same pitch was done. And uh, two thirds of the people voted for the male voice. So showing a sort of a gender bias. And as uh, Tilini said, uh, when it comes to capabilities, uh, both equal or in many instances, females are better than males. But uh, it's just the bias, the, the tide they have to move against. So one of the questions I saw in the chat was like, what, I'm, uh, what are the things I'm doing? Or, uh, so answering that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, on the serving on the board of a Silicon Valley startup where we're trying to like uh, democratize the whole VC process. So not only democratize, but uh, we also have our own fund. And what we want to do is uh, through AI and machine learning, uh, trying to get rid of uh, not only gender bias, uh, but cultural bias, age bias. So, so we have uh, two things we're tackling because when it's like humans uh, do, uh, being involved in the pitching process, hearing the pitches, it's like a limited number of applications that could be taken in. And most uh, come from male uh, startups through networks. So through this, we find that we can uh, get a lot of other pitches, uh, applications, which can be looked through. Uh, through algorithms. And uh, the other thing is there won't be a bias uh, against it, hopefully. And even if there is like, we uh, through machine learning, we want to like get uh, rid of it to, to a minimum. Thank you so much. Um, yes. We have a question uh, from Hansi. Um, she wants to know uh, if there is any work from home, flexible, um, our career opportunities with above mentioned app. I believe um, it's for Ms. Shamara. Yeah, so um, Project Sabagya and Sabagya as a channel is uh, actually a flexible working uh, model. Um, so the women choose the time they work and how much they work and, and how important it is um, for them to work. So if, if for example, they, uh, they have an elderly parent who has fallen ill and at that particular period they're unable to work, they can choose to um, not participate. Uh, and that's how the model is designed, that she chooses her hours, she chooses her workload. Uh, of course, that has an impact on her earnings uh, in that particular month, but it doesn't stop her from re-entering into, um, into the business back again. Uh, in terms of uh, working from home, and that's the project um, uh, Envoy, uh, which is an uh, which is right now in piloting. It's it's uh, we are in market testing, so it's not open today um, for participation. Uh, because what we are looking at is understanding that there is uh, a large quantum of women who are because of specifically having um, small children, uh, they're unable to leave their home and therefore they need the option of working from home. Uh, and so uh, Envoy, which is the digitization of Saubagya, uh, will aim to, to solve for that, um, but it is in pilot testing. And I saw there was another question on what would make this different to, um, to eBay. Um, see what, as I said, um, the framework is created um, in a way that it harnesses the skills and what she has at her, her um, disposal. Now, uh, women have their network and their friends and their community uh, at their disposal. And that is what um, our framework of Saubagya in, in the rural communities, because she's able to reach her family's friends uh, very easily. And 
it, it capitalizes on that and she can capitalize that for her economic growth. Now, what um, Envoy will do is again, her network, her friends who she can act as an ambassador, recommend products, and she will be accordingly rewarded for that introduction of new products. Um, and there will be a financial incentive, which will give her uh, the opportunity to earn as well as give um, discounts for the client base that she then creates. Um, so then that's, that's the model, which is, uh, as I said, in testing and not open for uh, participation immediately, but uh, hopefully and eventually will be. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a question for uh, Ms. Tilini. Uh, someone asked, uh, do you think the Sri Lankan education system from um, early years should be realigned to encourage more STEM job roles and what strategies could be adopted to implement um, STEM from early childhood education? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is absolutely. I mean, science, technology, uh, engineering and mathematics, that's what uh, it stands for definite definite need um so in terms of early years i would say um how you incorporate it or the focus should be about uh, introducing the fundamentals um, enhancing or even celebrating curiosity uh, highlighting the everyday use of all of these elements um and as they grow of course they can go into deeper understanding of concepts more project-based self-learning kind of assignments field trips, um, access to maybe highlighting of people in STEM needs to be done as well. Um, and we need to also make sure that the practical application is part of learning from very early on. Um, how to do it is the bigger challenge because it uh, involves the whole education system. Uh, that's a big beast. But um, I think at, at policymaking levels, uh, if there's an agreement um, and, you know, the industry that I'm in, there's so many females in the business and even the, the panelists here, they're using technology. So um, if they, uh, if, if the rule makers or the policy makers get into a dialogue, uh, that's what our industry bodies try to get into. Uh, that's the strategy to go for it. Uh, it's, it's somewhat of a mountain to climb, I would realistically say. All right. Uh I have another question for you, um, if you can answer, how can women-led uh, tech entrepreneurs compete in the market and thereby generating a profitable business? Well, it depends on the business, uh, the, the value prop of your product or the service. So I think uh, once you actually get the market out and you've got your marketing and uh, your um, funding sorted out, it's the, the value of the product or the service, right? So it's no different to male product or you know, it really doesn't matter from that point onwards. It's the step in the door that usually is the tough part. But after that, uh, it's uh, equal playing field. Um, I think women tech entrepreneurs can really study um, uh, what other people have done. Uh, also the failures or successes of other people uh, that have gone before or are uh, going into the foray, but really it's an in inward journey for me. Um, that's the way I look at it. You have to obviously know your market, but you have to be really strong in what you're proposing to the market, the, the gap that you're trying to fill. That's the strength of your story and everything else has to stem from that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, I have a question for Mr. Talal. Um, what in your opinion would be a microfinancing model uh, to be implemented in Sri Lanka for female entrepreneurs? And what should the role um, of the government be in such a model? You're muted. We can hear you, you're, you're muted, muted. Can you unmute yourself? <laughs> I think he's Hello. trying to get started. <laughs> you're, you're muted, we can't hear you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I think like we can uh, move to the next question. In the meantime, um, Carl can figure out the technical issues. 
All right. Um, so I have a question for Nilusha. How can the private sector effectively incorporate women-led entrepreneurs um, into its supply chain effectively? Um, so far, from our experience, we've seen that you need an intentional effort to make sure that you incorporate females into your supply chain. And uh, based on some of the examples that I shared, effective training, providing some of the resources, making some of the connections, uh, whether it be local authorities or vendors or service providers, is really helpful uh, for female entrepreneurs to get into the supply chain. Whether it be you are growing something as a farmer or whether it is you, are, uh, you have a small product that you want to put on a supermarket shelf, what we've realized is uh, A, they lack the funding, B, they lack the skills to be able to sell that product and market it in a way to a large scale retailer. So it is the skills, the resources, the funding and the connections with which we can help uh, for small scale entrepreneurs. Um, Rajve, you are uh, muted. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we have a question for, um, from Anun Khalid. Um, in developing countries, the major problem is myths about progression and also the deep-rooted uh, patriarchy and sexism in minds of people, especially women, let, uh, let them to accept the subordinate status to men. Please mention the strategies while prevailing progression um, among women of developing country to show them a way to be uh, independent structure. Um, I think if um, Ms. Shamara, if you can answer the question. You are muted. Hello. Sorry, um, sorry, do you mind repeating the question? So someone mentioned like in developing countries, the major problem is um, myths about progression and also the deep rooted patriarchy and sexism in minds of people, yeah. especially women, uh, let them to accept the subordinate status to men. Please mention yeah. the strategies while prevailing progression among uh, women of developing country to show them a way to be independent uh, structure. Yeah. So, um, so uh, the, the particular example that I spoke of, uh, it, uh, it ensures that she is actually not, uh, she is her own boss and she is the one who creates um, her work hours, her, her business. And she is enabled to, uh, to develop it as big or, or retain it as, um, as uh, uh, adaptable and, and as small as she wants it to be. Um, so I think frameworks, is first and foremost uh, a critical part that you need to have uh, that there is a framework that we as businesses also create those frameworks um, that enable women to succeed uh, now we've done it in such a way that uh, women can um, you know they volunteer and it's uh, it's their own uh, decision to be part of it um, and that's that's one aspect of it. Uh, the second is also in terms of um, uh, ensuring that, and, and this is a, this is beyond the example that I spoke of, and this is as an organization, uh, Unilever, how we drive diversity, inclusion, and equity within our business is it is top-down led. Um, there has to be a call for it. It has to be driven. Uh, and it is a global mandate and it is monitored and KPIs are there and it is on, um, you know, uh, personnel as, as uh, both HR as well as line managers uh, KPIs in driving diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, and that is how you can actually ensure that um, the environment is created for not just women, but uh, inclusion in general uh, is ensured across an organization. So the, the, the principles that the business stands for and that is governed uh, is, is critical in ensuring that um, uh, females uh, are accepted uh, as uh, line managers as well as subordinates in the system. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Um, I have another question for you. Uh, do organizations which promote gender balance keep a tab on existing distribution to meet the gender balance in the organization depriving a more suitable candidate? And how do companies handle the situation? Okay. So I will, um, I think that's a two-parted uh, question. So the first is, and I think I need to explain the particular um, project which we spoke of. Now, that was intended for women and that does not uh, include men. Uh, the reason is that uh, we saw it as a gender gap and the, uh, the channel is designed to uh, create that opportunity for women. And because of that, um, and because as I said, it captures on the uh, aspects that give women an advantage. It's her network, it's her time flexibility that she has and wants. Uh, it is also a business that is done in such a way that the framework is for women. Um, and so therefore uh, that particular um, uh, channel is, is designed for women. Now, uh, in the in the larger uh, stream of the business, uh, and particularly if I was uh, to talk about um, sales or customer development for us in Unilever, yes, we do look uh, to 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 monitor uh, the amount of women because we we do believe that we are underrepresented. Uh, and uh, yes, I am a woman in sales, and yes, I am a woman in sales leadership, but there is still. Uh, a gap to fill and that is something that as an organization we are monitoring and we are driving but that does not mean that a, uh, a better qualified or better suitable male will be overlooked uh, and that is why we are there as leaders to make those decisions. Uh, a woman will not be selected over a man uh, who is better skilled or better uh, qualified for the job and uh, and that is uh, fairness that uh, any company uh, needs to uh, to occupy in its system and that uh, that that is part of the governance uh, that is there in the business uh, and that is what is important um, so yes the answer is um, we we do have a channel which is specifically for women uh, but uh, no uh, um, a man who is not, uh, who is better qualified, uh, will not be overlooked um, within the larger stream of the business. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for answering that. We have another question uh, for you uh, from Archana. So she's um, coordinating a project in her um, office. So she wants to know what kind of KPI or monitoring mechanism you have used to. Um, ensure that program is making an impact in their lives and also what suggestions um, you'd give to uh, amplify the program to reach more targeted women in the future. Okay, so um, because, we, because this, is, this channel is designed to impact livelihoods, so the first thing that we do monitor is uh, the income that they generate. Uh, and that is a critical part of our monitoring. So we, as I said, there are women who uh, come into the business with the intention of being a main or a sole breadwinner. And now the intention is then therefore for, and, and their commitment is then much larger uh, and, and their, their willingness to actually drive their business is much larger. Now, based on that, uh, we are able to drive that business. So uh, we make, we have principles in place where we ensure that, you know, there is, uh, when we give them a, a, an area to handle, that there is less overlapping between one and the other, another Saabagi entrepreneur. So based on her business and her willingness and her ability to drive her business, we will monitor uh, and uh, allow her to expand her reach um, uh, based on how she is willing. So first is we need to keep a look on her income as well as her willingness uh, to drive that business. So the, the growing entrepreneurs is something that we uh, monitor uh, as well as anyone who was in, you know, who was making a certain income and, and they're falling back. Then to actually connect back and understand what has actually led to them uh, falling back on um on, on the uh, business that they, uh, they are exploring. And oftentimes it is situation-based and they eventually do come back. 
over the years, as I said, it's it's two decades, nearly two decades of this project. So over the years, we have learned how to uh, make this business grow. And the importance is uh, when you're starting off, my advice is you have to be patient because the framework needs fine tuning and the patience from a business is required. It needs to fulfill financial return for the business so that the business retains its um, interest. But uh, there is also uh, an initial teething period uh, where the costs will be higher than the return. Um, so we took uh, almost close to about four uh, years to break even. But now uh, we have a, a, a good profitable business uh, model that uh, we have in South Bagia. Um, the other is we influence other aspects of her life. Um, so her child's education we have scholarship programs in place, which is available in material of, you know, if you're the top performing, uh, high um, revenue generating uh, um, uh, entrepreneurs, or whether you are just joined in, um, you your children are eligible for the annual book list, as well as for scholarship programs, if they are um, uh, ex excelling in their education or sports or other extracurricular activities. Um, so that's another aspect that really helps uh, impact their lives. We also have incentive programs, um, which monetarily incentivize her as well as reward her. So, you know, everyone wants to be rewarded and recognized. So similar to uh, annual sales awards that we have for uh, the, um, the, the Unilever sales uh, team, we also have for these women and um, they are recognized for uh, being the best entrepreneur or, you know, being high performing entrepreneurs. Um, in terms of amplifying the uh, program reach, um, so as I said, going into the future, because we recognize that uh, technology can make a difference into this, um, that's why we are exploring um, the avenues of Project Envoy and Usync, uh, because we realize that um, Usync, for example, reduces our costs as well, because delivery times uh, as well as servicing times can be organized based on her and her availability as well. So there is benefit that can be uh, achieved through uh, taking it into technology platforms. Um, and those, and I spoke of um, Envoy before, so I won't um, explain that again, but those are the uh, uh, ways we will amplify this program into the future. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, well, uh, I want to be respectful of time here, as, as I know our panelists have already made time out of their busy schedule and might need to hop off to other commitments. I really wish uh, we had more time to continue the discussion, but I believe um, we have covered some key concepts today uh, in terms of understanding why it's important for uh, different stakeholders to uh, provide women the access to resources to embark on their entrepreneurial journey in the business world. Uh, the significance of women tech entrepreneurs and why we should um, nurture them. We also um, talked about the rural entrepreneurship for women, as well as the role of private sector in empowering women entrepreneurs. I hope this uh, conversation won't just be limited to today's session, but you uh, take the key learnings from today and apply them in your individual capacity. Um, and the UN this team is always here to support you in this mission. So don't hesitate to reach out to us um, afterwards. I would like to thank uh, all of our panelists today for taking their time to share a glimpse of their past experience. And thanks to UNGC Sri Lanka for organizing this event and uh, to all our attendees for uh, being present here today, showing your commitment uh, to achieving gender equality in different ways, including empowering uh, women technopreneurs. Thank you once again, and we will. See you in another event. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.